The superhero genre may be in decline in terms of comic book sales, but with movies, TV, and licensing, properties like Batman and the Avengers are worth more than ever. Meanwhile, Comic-Cons have become mainstream, and you can even study superheroes in college classes. Today we are joined by a University of Oregon professor who has lectured on the subject of superheroes at schools and universities all over the country. Coming up next on the Spent the Rant podcast, the founder of the world's first undergraduate minor in comic studies, Professor Ben Saunders. Welcome to the Spent the Rent Podcast. I am your host, Self Esteem Boat Willie. My guest today is University of Oregon professor Ben Saunders. Ben, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, you've been coming to the barbershop now for a few years. And basically, right when we had first been, you know, became acquainted, I was like, ooh, I need to get him on, on an interview at some point. And now that this podcast is, is in full swing, I knew it was going to be a good one. So I've been hounding you. This is kind of the slow time, I, if that exists, you know, that... <sighs> The, the teaching doesn't doesn't start again for a couple more weeks, so that's good. Are you doing summer session? Uh, no, I, I'm not teaching, but summer is the time for the writing, so that is what I've been doing. Right. So uh, we're just going to go right into it. You are a professor in the English department at the University of Oregon, but you do something a little bit more kind of unique, and uh, you teach a class on comic books. Yeah, so- I teach a couple of classes on comics, actually. I, um, I teach a, something called Intro to Comic Studies, which is like a 200-level class for people who, who want to find out more, and that's um, I could tell you more about the content of that one. And I also teach a, a History of the Superhero class, which is, um, as you can imagine, a, a pretty popular one. And um, I run the minor. There are a lot of professors who teach a lot of different kinds of classes. So that, you know, I don't teach classes on manga, Japanese comics, for example, because I have colleagues who are specialists in Japanese right. culture who speak the language and they are much more qualified than me to do something sure. like that. So um, you'd mentioned that there is now a minor. And so you, you had right. created this, you founded it, the minor. And you can tell us more about that. Yeah, so a minor at the University of Oregon usually requires um, six courses taken over the a period of the four year period. Um, they can, depending on the nature of the minor, be within one department. The, you know, if you're doing a minor in cinema studies, obviously all the classes will be in cinema studies. Sure. Um, the comic studies minor is uh, genuinely interdisciplinary, so you can actually take courses in a number of different fields in order to add up to the minor. Um, we have, for example, there's one, uh, one class is taught entirely in French and it's taught, you get upper division French literature credit for, uh, Fabian Moore's, um, war in French comics class. Um, but then there are, uh, you know, and obviously that's not a requirement that's for students sure. who have those, the, the ability to take it. Um, I think it actually benefits the Department of Romance Languages more than it benefits comic studies at the moment, but I'm very, very glad that it, it gets taught. Um, and then there are classes in East Asian languages, classes in comparative literature, um, <clears throat> classes in um, arts and technology um, with a more of a drawing emphasis. And we recently hired uh, the very talented comic book writer, Matt Johnson, to teach a writing for comics class in oh, creative wow. writing. Which See, is- that's cool. And then that's something that is required for the minor. Uh, no, it's not a requirement, but that one is a popular one, obviously, because you get to study with a person who, with a, you know, a New York Times bestselling author of graphic novels. Right. And that's kind of, I mean, I hate, I hate the question of what are you going to do with that? You know, when somebody's studying something and obviously a minor, it's something that you want to do because maybe you're just slightly interested. Maybe it's not as, mm-hmm. you know, you know, Oregon is a business school in a lot of ways, uh-huh. but what is it that that you would do with that? I mean, is it now like that? obviously people want to get into making it a career to mm-hmm. write it, but then also to do the historian aspect of it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
There are so many things pro- uh, that are wrong with the question, what are I you know. going to do with that? Right. You know, one of them is the assumption that the only reason to ever do anything. I mean, what people mean by that, is, they don't mean what are you going to do with that? Sure. What they mean is how is that going to pay off? Sure. Um, in fine, And they mean that only one way. How is that going to pay off for you financially? Right. As if that's the only payoff in life. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the question itself betrays um, a manner of thinking that is one of the reasons why there are dead spots in the oceans the size of Europe. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and I found... You know, what are you going to do with that? I don't know. Um uh, uh, grow spiritually, sure, um, learn sure. something, have some um, experiences with my mind that I couldn't otherwise have. Well, and, the, and then the reality yeah. is, is that <laughs> later down the road, people that are passionate about comics and that take the course and the minor, that's probably the one that they're going to tell people about. Well, you and know? of course, so yes, there is a vocational element right. to it from that point of view as well as it's not just a conversational sure. thing though, right? I mean, if, if you're learning um, I mean, what are comics? They are a hybrid form of communication that involves both um, imagery and a verbal component. Um, ever since there have been comics, they've been fundamental to ideas of branding and advertising. Comics have been used to sell products from the moment that uh, comics have existed. Right. Um, so if you're interested in communication and if you're interested in communication for business purposes, for advertising purposes, then it's it's a it's obviously a it's thing that you a, might want to grasp on it. Yeah. You know, I did an interview with the University Esports team, which is really cool. And one of the things I learned from it was that the creative aspect behind the scenes, because everybody thinks about the people on the sticks, the people playing the games. But there's so much of a creative process that goes into the imagery, the uh, overlays, you know, cause the videos are getting really popular. And so that was really neat because one of the guests, she was telling you know us that essentially her, her family's like, you're going to play video games for a mm-hmm. living. She's like, no, I'm actually going to broadcast them. <laughs> like it's not even about the game playing itself for what sure. she was doing. And I thought that was really neat. So that's kind of what I was getting at that. There's gotta be a lot of different ways that it can be used. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that it's, it's a, I mean, far more ways than a imaginatively limited professor such as myself is ever going to be able to enumerate. Sure, I'm sure. always astonished by the things that students go on to do with their degrees in the humanities. Right. And they go on to do a lot of really interesting and creative and sometimes extremely lucrative things. Right. But it's it's a the notion that there is a sort of... Um, uh, that there is like a channel that you drive people down and that everybody is going to end up at the end with some with the same product. Um, you know, we're not... I'm a teacher. I don't make widgets. I, <laughs> right. I, I try to, to put ideas in front of people um, in order for them to have an opportunity to do things with ideas that they, they might otherwise have not encountered. Right. right. And, and that's... Um, you know that's the that's a, a privilege, absolutely. Sure. It's a it's a privilege for me to be able to do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is a form of privilege to being able to go to college, but the privilege isn't just that you will automatically um, be in a higher tax bracket when you right, graduate. Right. So and and you know you talk about being an educator, being a teacher. Uh, if anybody is hasn't gone to college, then they may not be familiar. But if you have, then you know of the Grade My Professor website, oh, God, which yeah. is <laughs> which is really important for the students. I think. But, Do they still use it? I would, I would, I would guess by now that there's probably some other platform that I don't even know. You about. know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I did look it up, mm-hmm. and and you were on there, and you had been scored pretty highly, four point five out of five. Now, to get a perfect score is impossible because yeah. if someone's tardy a lot or skips class, they're like, he was a bad teacher, he failed me. Sure, you know, but four point five is a really good score, and a lot of the common thread that I saw was that you were considered the cool teacher. And huh. at the time that I've known you, I would imagine that that was not something you ever would foresee becoming the reality. So, you know. You, what, you, you, you don't think I'm cool? Well, that's... Not, you know, <laughs> no, no. It's, you know, it's just funny because you've always been so humble and oh. kind of laid back. But but I think it's kind of, it's pretty funny. If you read the comments one after another, he's the coolest teacher. He's the coolest teacher. He's a cool teacher. It's a really, uh, first of all, it's... I mean, thank you for sure. saying that. It's a very nice thing to say. It's a nice thing to hear. If it's true, it's uh, I. Um, I don't know anyone who has known me for a very long time will be aware of um, 
of how actually how I feel like I have fought with aspects of myself sure for um for decades since I was a teenager and really became fully self-conscious I have wrestled with those um more ordinarily narcissistic parts of myself that I think that we all have I'm not pathologizing myself no yet. for sure um but but um there have definitely been periods of my life where being thought of as cool would have been very important to me. Right. And there's, there have been periods of my life, I think, even in when I was a younger teacher, where um, um, I saw the room more as perhaps uh, as much. I wanted to teach people, but I also wanted it to be a venue for my own, um, you know, intellectual pirouetting or right. something. Um and um, I have fought with those tendencies. I don't think they make me, I think they can get away in the way of doing the job. But I think that self-actualization is why people find you relatable. You know, well, you know be, and, and college professors in general, a lot of times that are more human than maybe the high school teachers that we had, that they kind of, I mean, and nowadays you have to evolve to cater to, to students and the generation. It's different because you're not just being spoke at kids actually have expression and feeling mm -hmm. you know and are being heard so that's interesting yeah uh, i mean you know i don't it's um, i know it's such a it's such a relative term what's cool anyway no but, no and i i mean i think that i one of the things that i learned from my wife one of the earliest conversations i had with with my wife who is a sort of lifelong punk rocker ideologically um we were having a conversation about what we thought punk was and um she said you, you know and i was making uh, i was thinking about the visual signifiers of of a very traditional notion of what punk means you know wearing certain clothes having a certain Mohawk, haircut, yeah, you know, right. that kind of, um which you know i mean i i should have known better I, I, but i that's i'd gone to a superficial place temporarily um and she said that for her um the punk was about really not caring what people sure. thought was cool that it was in it was about you know if you if it was cool for you then it was cool and that's it for you my favorite band is no effects mm -hmm. and a lot of people in the punk community say they're not punk which to me makes them more punk uh -huh. <laughs> you know because essentially they don't care right you know right and, and, and you, know, you and can I, just tell you could be at a fast food restaurant and you're like that guy's in a punk band yeah. and it doesn't mean he has a mohawk and a misfits patch on his jacket right it means that he you know there's this there's a style there that are you familiar with the british band the damned at all they're part of the classic uh Sex Pistols, Clash. I think era I've heard the British name, but punk. I am such. I'm not an almanac when it comes to music. Uh -huh. There's only. I don't listen to anything made after 1997 for uh -huh. one. And, uh, Really, I stick with No Effects, Propagandi, Lagwagon, uh -huh. Face to Face, a lot of Fat Records bands. Sure. And that's kind of my niche. I mean, Bad Religion. But yeah, uh -huh. as far as punk, I am so limited that, uh -huh. because I'm not into the crass stuff and all that. Well, but you, might, you might want to check out The Damned sometime I'll look, because I'll look them up. They're, they're sort of, they, they're, what, what I loved about them was, first of all, they're part of that original generation of British punkers, and their look is really interesting. Dave Vaney and the front man actually has a kind of. He looked like a young Dracula. He had the big widow's peak and he would dress goth before. It was before goth, but he had this kind of goth sure. look. And then the guitar player, Captain Sensible, he was inclined to wear, um, <clears throat> you know, a caps not unlike yours. But then he would wear these big pink, puffy, furry sweaters. Oh, wow. So they're all different. And then the drummer looked like more of a kind of a, um, uh, an unkempt, shaggy rocker. Right. Um, you know, kind of ripped jeans and leather jacket kind of guy. And so that, uh, and then their sound, this is also something that I loved about them. They sound very, what people think of as punk, um, you know, three minute, very fast, right. um, uh, aggressive guitar based music, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, um, and then as they, they age, uh, they're like, well, you know, we don't want to do that for our whole lives. It doesn't mean we're not punk if we're interested in, in experimenting with different forms of sound, sure, writing longer songs. Um, there's a song called Curtain Call on the Black Album, which is their fifth or sixth album, which is a whole side long. That's like Pink Floyd territory. It's sort of anti-punk, right? Right. Um, but they didn't care. Yeah, No Effects has a song that's 18 minutes long. Yeah, yeah. You see, yeah, yeah. So let's get back to comics. Even sure. though you did just just nonchalantly say his name is Captain Sensible. Yes. Which is which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, before we get real deep into comics, I want to go on one other 
uh, thing off the point, and then we'll do, we'll just delve right into comics. Sure. So you had met basketball player Grant Hill. Yeah. <laughs> and so so you got your PhD <clears throat> from Duke University. Yeah. So I, I, I grew up in Wales. Um, I was an undergraduate at a place called the University of East Anglia, which is in the east of England. Um, and um, then I did a one-year master's at Cambridge University, which is kind of my springboard to the United States. I decided then I didn't, I didn't actually care for Cambridge very much, to be honest. Um, I had tried to get in as an undergraduate. That's a good story, actually, if you want to hear that story. Sure. Um, so, okay, back up all the way, right? So I'm in, I'm in Wales. I'm, I, I, I went to a, a, what's called a comprehensive school there. It's not a, um, it's, it's not a private school. It's a, a, not a, not a lot of wealthy kids. And, um, none of my teachers had been to Oxford or Cambridge, and nobody from my school had got into Oxford or Cambridge in about eight or nine years. But but they would always hopefully send a handful of kids up there in the hope that they would get into these elite institutions. And they picked me as one of these kids that they thought maybe you could get in. And they, they, they you know, they sent me there. But I had no preparation for the entrance process at all, right? So I entered this room in these fancy, um, you know, uh, I mean, you've seen, you know, the, the, what this stuff looks like on TV shows, right? right. It's like this ancient building with these two, um, Cambridge Dons sitting in it. And I applied to do philosophy because I didn't think their, in- their English program was actually very interesting. Uh, philosophy is not something I'd ever studied as an undergraduate though. It didn't exist. Um, so that these two English Donish philosophers and I walked into the room and sat down and um, they asked me to prove that they existed. That was their first question. That was the Cambridge ent- entrance exam question. So how would you go about proving um, that, that we exist, um, me and my colleague? And I said, who wants to know? Um, which I thought was a really good answer. <laughs> right. And, um, and then the guy looked at me and said, uh, ha, no. Uh, and, the in- and the interview just... <laughs> <laughs> did this no, right. it was nosedived you right. know um and you know it was the first time that i'd met british private school educated boys and they had this gravitas to them that i associated with people like my grandfather sure. I mean, their, their clothes alone you know i had a mullet i was very 80s um i was wearing these these off the peg uh, uh, trousers with um, like color flex in them. They were gray, but they had all this, these sort of color. I mean, it was so, uh, I, I, I remember thinking, thinking I was cool right up to the moment where I got off the train and walked towards the college and realized none of these kids look like me, <laughs> right? That they, that you they, want to stick out, but you also want to blend. I in. looked like, this I looked like a yokel from the provinces stylistically right. compared to them. They 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 were they radiated a different like they were like grown ups and I was still a kid. Um so I didn't get into Cambridge as an undergraduate and I guess it I guess it stung, you know, and and, and I did apply as a graduate student. I got in as a graduate student and um, I wasn't terribly happy there when I did actually get in. There were a lot of things about it that I didn't like. And I thought um, uh, that the, and someone I met an American exchange student there who told me that if you got into an elite American institution like Duke, they actually would pay for your graduate education. Right. And they would expect you to teach and it takes longer than it does in Britain. In Britain, getting a PhD takes three or four years. Um, in America, it takes five to seven years. Um, but because they're working you through that process, but you are get they, they give you some money. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, I don't know, a frog in my throat. So I thought, okay, I'll apply for that. So I took a year out. I worked for British Telecom, and I used the, every my weekends to basically put together a, a, to plot my assault on the United States. And I I, <laughs> right. I, I, I sent the, all of these various um, documents and you know checks to these different institutions. I ended up getting into Duke University, and so it was my first. Um, time in the United States. I hadn't even been to the U.S. before. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I arrived in North Carolina. Um, you know, I remember the... I mean, I can remember the the sliding doors at the at, the, at Raleigh-Durham Airport opening and this wave of warm 
wet air rolling <laughs> over me sure and being like oh wow you know i'm really somewhere different right you know? and i swear i'm not making this up i stepped out onto the concourse where the, you know the, i was going to get picked up and there was a guy selling newspapers um just you know just sort of down from the entrance and written on the front of the box that he had there was durham north carolina murder capital of the united states <laughs> And <laughs> very, very well. That was the first thing I saw. Yeah, and it turned out to be. I mean, you know, per capita, it'd been true. The previous year, they had had more, um, uh, more homicides per capita than um, the New Orleans or DC. Wow. Um, so yeah, that was you know that was my my welcome. Um, and I'd been there maybe two or three. I went onto the campus, which is a beautiful campus. I had brought a packed lunch with me. And um, there was a, a bench on the quad, and there was a tall black guy sitting on that bench, and otherwise it was empty. I'm pretty sure he was by himself. I just sat down, and I do not remember how I initiated the conversation. I know I said something. Right. Um, and he turned and looked at me, and he said, where are you from, man? Because he obviously heard my accent, which was much stronger in those days. Sure. And I said, um, I'm from Wales. And he said, I can remember the details because the questions were so mysterious to me at the time. Right? And I really was brand new in the country. He said, uh, you play much basketball where you're from? And uh, I said, no, no, we're a famously short race. You know? <laughs> um, and he said, uh, have you been to see the team since you're here? And I said, no, no, I've only been here, you know, a couple of days, actually. Um, and he said, you, you, you plan on going? And I said, well, I've got to admit, it's not why I came here. <laughs> right. Um, I, 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 I came to, he said, oh yeah, why did you come here? I said, I came to study English literature. He said, uh, so you came from the UK to study English in North Carolina. <laughs> and, right. he, and he smiled right. at that. Right. And, and I thought, you know, yeah, I guess that does sound, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I did. Uh, and then he asked me what sports I did like, and I'm racking my brain to think of something. Just to think of anything. Um, you know, and I said, well, I guess I like football. And he said, you mean soccer, right? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess I do mean soccer, actually. I mean, you know, it's different. I hadn't even thought of that. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about soccer, but I don't know that much about it. Um, and um, I don't know he said a few other things. Um, and then he, he said, well, you know, I got to go. He stood up. And he extended his hand. He said, my name's Grant. And I said, I'm Ben. We shook hands. Uh, he said, nice talking to you. And he walked away. And I thought, well, you know, that was a pleasant encounter. I didn't think too much more of it. Um, and I would see him around over the next few months. Um, you know, I would walk past him in a corridor. I'd see him in a crowd. I always gave him a wave. He always waved back. He was always friendly. Um, we never really spoke again. Right. Um, and it was at least three months later, um, during a spring break, when a friend of mine who had season tickets for the, uh, the, the, the Blue Devils game said, Do you want to actually see the basketball game? And I was like, well, you know, if somebody else is paying and yeah, sure, I'll go. <laughs> um, so I went to my, my first and only um, basketball game while in the, in the six, seven years I was at Duke University. Um, and this, there he is, he's out there, like, you know, leading the team. And the guy that I was with, uh, um, he's a professor of English in Canada now named John Hunter. Uh, his name was John Hunter then too. Um, he, <laughs> he said, uh, oh, that guy there, that's, that's, that's Grant Hill. He's kind of carrying the team right now. He just signed a $50 million contract with the, the Detroit Pistons. Right. He's like, hadn't even finished college. No, he's, he's, he's like, been, he's the yeah. top M uh, NBA draft pick, number one player, you know, kind of the, uh, the reason that we have a shot at another championship title. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I know Grant. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. yeah, we're like that, you know, we're buddies. Right. Um, but that was the, that was when I realized, and of course it all fell into place then why he had asked me all those questions. Cause it's so rare. Cause that's, that's why I was probably one of five people on the campus who didn't know who, who he didn't was. know who he was. And the other four were blind, yeah. but like, you know, that, that was, you had told me that story in the barbershop and it cracked me up so much because 
here's this guy from Wales, uh-huh. and you're telling me the story like, oh, I'm not really into basketball. And it's just like, this is the biggest player. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer now, mm-hmm. had a 19-year NBA career. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just it's just funny. We should get to comics. Well, sure. <laughs> I just want to say, by the way, he yeah. was absolutely charming. Oh, he's it, a great it, man. it was one of the first conversations that I had with an American right. in the United States. Right. And, and it, it couldn't have been you know, a nicer or more friendly interaction. And he was always friendly when I saw him afterwards. Of all of the people that you could just happen to sit down next to going to Duke, not knowing anything that it's a huge basketball school, especially no, at that time, because that was what we're going to, we're going to date you a little bit here, but that was 94, 93, 93. Yeah. yeah. So I would only know that because of basketball. Yeah, no, it was the fall so, of 93. I arrived in this country, um, August 14th, 1993. So wow. it would have been just a couple of days after that. Wow. Okay, so comics. So the Comic-Cons across the country have really grown. And Eugene has the Comic-Con now. I mentioned that in the intro that it's become basically mainstream. Mm-hmm. Cosplay is something that is, has taken off. I think it's been done forever. But it's just something that really now the access with the internet and everything, the access to the parts for your costumes and whatnot. So it's grown as an art off. Form. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even Halloween costumes are crazy compared to what we saw when we were kids sure so um i guess my question would be what is your favorite comic-con that you've been to oh <clears throat> that's gonna be hard you're gonna be on the spot uh you, you know i mean so they've changed so much right i mean when i so i was at the emerald city comic-con which um uh before reed pop bought it was one of my favorites and um i mean i liked it when it was independently run and emerald city that's in seattle or is that eugene? that's in seattle okay. it's about eighty thousand people over three or four days because somehow eugene um, thinks it's the emerald city but i don't understand yeah that. well you I'm know sure how that i mean you know for me that's just it's the wizard of oz but <laughs> right, you know. right right um and that's I, near wales yeah. so. <laughs> so so i um i was i was um i was moderating a panel um with uh two guys named Kieran Gillen and Jamie McKelvey who are also um actually also british um they do a wonderful independent comic called the wicked and the divine which which i am sure will be a major t v series one day um it's a brilliant concept about um a kind of um uh, it, it uh, the idea is that there's this group of people who are reborn cyclically and um, uh, they will they have powers in this particular case or they will be they, they become world famous but they have to die young um, it's like the condition of their of, of, of their success so it's a sort of riff on romantic poetry on pop stars and on superheroes all at once right um, and there were already lots of people in the audience cosplaying as their characters, even though there's been no TV show. Right. The whole front row was people cosplaying. But the room itself, because this is one of the more popular comics, it was one of the bigger rooms. There were maybe 300, 400 people in the room. And um, at an event that brings in, you know, 80,000 people over about three or four days. The very first comic book convention that I went to was actually a science fiction convention in the Central Hotel in Cardiff in the early 1980s. There were fewer than 300 people who attended the entire right. convention, right? And I had this feeling sitting there just waiting to start looking out at this room. I think there are more people in this room now than, we're at the, than yeah. attended the entire wow. show the first time that I went to one of these things. And that was a pretty, the one in Cardiff was, was marketed and all that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was just a different, it was then, you know, the word geek really was a term of abuse. Sure. And it was this weird set of niche interests i mean i i tell you what i felt sitting there was i just felt like we won right we just right. won i mean this room is filled with people it's filled with smart beautiful intelligent young people right um there are uh, more women than men in the room i mean you, you know the, the the everything that anyone thinks that they know oh, yeah. about the demographics of comic book conventions and geek culture um every cliche every stereotype um they're all wrong right and this 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 is a just a a room filled with people who are interested in this medium and this art form and the kind of stories that you can tell in this art form and um there are uh, the, the the there isn't one dominant um gender or or race 
um, uh, right. who are interested in it's these global. materials. Yeah, this is this is this is the, everybody likes fantasies of glamour and power, right. um, and that's essentially what the superhero narratives are. Most people, if they're not dead from the neck up, are capable of responding to um, uh, well-drawn visual narratives. So. It, you know, the weird thing is why it was so small and why it was so looked down upon once upon, upon a time, because it didn't take long when you think about it. I mean, about half the length of time that I've been on the planet, I've witnessed this radical this transformation. It's, I think it has to be the Internet. I think it has to be the Internet allowing people to know that they're not the only person that kind of feels like that that's into that kind of stuff yeah you yeah know? it probably has yes Cause of for, course because right? forums and where people can really pick them apart which i'm sure that and that's that's the thing it's like with star wars for example uh -huh. star wars is something that people can criticize and debate until the end of time right but those forums are annoying but also incredible and i think it's lighthearted. it's something that people can debate just like sports mm -hmm. and the, you know the geek culture has taken over a place that once was only sports driven you look at video games sports video games are not as popular anymore as the fantasy games right not right. even close huh. you know and so i mean i when i, I did say, not know that but that it, oh i mean i'm you know 2k is a, a popular basketball game but at Madden, when you tell someone you play Madden, they're like, oh, I don't play that. I mean, I haven't played that in 10 years, you know. But so as far as the Comic Cons, uh, has there has, has there been anybody that you were starstruck by meeting? Now, the reason I asked this, it's funny because when you met Grant Hill, you had no clue that he was one of the biggest basketball players in the history of the game. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so is there anyone, though, that you have met that you just were like choked up couldn't even talk oh my talk. god yeah i mean I'm right sure from the very lot. beginning i mean you know i met alan moore three times right. uh, when i mean i something really interesting was happening in british comics in the 1980s it's probably one of the reasons that to this day i remain compelled by by the medium you know and i missed a lot of the revolutions in other popular art forms you know i missed the golden age of hollywood i wasn't even born sure and i, and I, I in many ways, I think I missed the really important moment of rock and roll, um, you know, and I missed, um, uh, I wasn't living in the United States in the 1980s um, when um, when hip hop was really emerging and sort of changing people's sense of what popular music could be. I missed all these things. But but you saw the 90s when hip, when hip hop became widespread like it was accepted yes although you know, i th that, that changed although i actually think that um my own taste preferences were not for what then crossed over to the mainstream sure, i'm more sense. i'd be more interested in what was you know not trying to be cool about it or anything but um i felt like i'm really not you know i mean it was just it, it, if i listened to the so-called alternative um hip-hop artists of the 90s if i think of a um, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone or, or even the early 2000s people. So people like Charlie Tuna and, uh, you know, Jurassic Five or uh, Pete Rock, you know, who, who were never having quite the same level of, you know, what Pete Rock did by bringing jazz into hip hop. Right, right. Um, they never have the, that level of visibility of what really crossed over in terms of what I think of as successful, most successful 90s hip hop would be Dr. Dre or West Coast, Tupac. Yeah. And, um and I honestly just never cared for that stuff very much. I know that it's sort of sacrilegious to say, to, but you know, Tupac never I did never, it for me. Yeah. I thought I kind of thought the guy was a jerk. Well, gangster and, rap, gangster rap never. Though I I feel it has value. Snoop was different. Sure. I mean, I, I he's actually, universal. Yeah, <laughs> but, but though it has value in in culture, uh -huh. I think that it has because it's allowed a lot of people to understand what a different reality could look like. Uh -huh. I I'm the same way. It just never resonated with me because I can't relate to it. I mean, you know, Tupac. Tupac was was you know prof I mean he, he was a profoundly misogynistic guy sure. who sexually abused a, a, a number of women. I mean this wasn't a, an idol that that I I wanted. And you could say the same thing, of course, about um, I mean it, you Elvis, know probably uh, uh, well certainly <laughs> yeah. you know or Led Zeppelin or sure. um, you know with the I mean the culture has changed right. But you, we're talking a lot about music. I didn't realize I want I, you know I would go here. Um, or the Rolling Stones, you know. Um, I mean, obviously there are this, this, this. There's the a current of of uh, um, aggressively performed misogyny that runs through a lot of popular music, and it, it isn't just Tupac. But actually, I find I love certain things by the Stones. I'm sure I could probably pick a couple of Tupac tracks that I like. You know, sure. I remember listening to All Eyes on Me and thinking, you know, not in my head. Right. But 
I was more interested in what other people were doing at that time. And more importantly, I didn't feel like I was ahead of that curve. Like I was hearing it, you know, other people would introduce me to it. Um, I, I needed to be educated um, by friends who understood that medium more than I did. Whereas with comics, I was, you know, I was 12 years old and going to this tiny little convention um, and meeting people who would go on to become, in the case of Alan Moore, for example, um, probably one of the most influential British writers in any medium, not right. just comics, of the last half century. And I met him when before he'd even done Swamp Thing, let alone Watchmen. I met when I met him, he was just doing um, what we were uh, stories called Future Shocks for a British weekly magazine called 2000 AD, which amazingly still comes out and is still called 2000 AD, which tells you a lot about British ideas of the future. Right. Um, but uh, you know, it, it still sounds like somehow like like the future. Over right. There. Um, even though we're twenty years. Past. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but. <clears throat> And uh, this was, you know, 2000, 2000 AD was still in the future and um, Alan was writing for that 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 comic and uh, something called Warrior had just come out, which contained the very first episodes of V for Vendetta and a book that he was writing called Marvel Man, which later became known as Miracle Man, was his first sort of real reinvention of the superhero. Um, so, you know, he looked like a roadie for Iron Maiden. He hadn't yet become... Um, the warlock of Northampton that he right, would later right. sort of transmute into. He didn't have the rings or anything. Um, he was tremendously approachable, very friendly. People were not, he wasn't famous, so people were not following him around or harassing him. Um, I took a stack, I had a shopping bag of 2080s, which I took to his table. He signed every one of oh, them wow. for me. Wow. It took to me for like four hours. Wow. And over the course of that, sure. you know, two days, we talked for hours. I mean, we talked about Stephen King. We talked about um, whether he would ever reveal um, the face behind V's mask, um, which he was, you know, he said he would not. Um, we talked about politics. We talked about, um, you know, Thatcherism wow. and why he hated v her. V for Vendetta. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to ask later, but that movie was incredible. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I want to ask about what movie that has been adapted that you might have already answered that. That was the best execution. I mean, that movie is incredible. You know, I'm not even familiar with the comic. And it uh -huh. was, it, it's one that stands alone without it you know I'm, I'm not sure about the comic if it was real if it stuck to the truth of the it, you know it's it it, it then it's not a completely fa faithful adaptation it's probably one of the more successful adaptations of any of alan moore's material right um which you know the watchmen there was a this is terrible and i shouldn't joke about it but someone shot themselves in the theater at valley river so i heard that one wasn't a good one <laughs> <laughs> um uh it 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 wouldn't be the it, it wouldn't be the I wouldn't want that to be the last thing I saw before I died. That is legit. That actually um, happened in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, that's very so, sad. So uh, we, we, you know, I want to get to a couple of these questions uh, before we get too far off track. One of the things at Comic Cons, you speak a lot at different Comic Cons, and one of the things that you've been recognized for is your book uh, titled "Do Gods Wear Capes," uh -huh. and. Uh, particularly the chapter on bondage imagery in Wonder Woman. Huh. So I wanted you to speak on that. Is that something that at Comic Cons you've been asked a lot to speak on? Oh yeah, yeah. That's actually, the, that's, that's probably the most recurring thing. Yeah. Um, yes, that's the the. I mean, it began as um, a lecture in one of my classes, right? And it it, it gradually evolved into a presentation with a and a slideshow. And the material is quite funny. I mean, you can't lose. It's also fascinating. Sure. Um, and um, and it's about sex without, I think, being particularly sexy, which makes it um, um, which makes it suitable for a general audience in a way. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's not. I'm not sure if I would feel a hundred percent comfortable talking in ways that it would be perfectly legitimate to talk about bondage imagery sure um at a comic con with a mixed audience and all ages yeah, yeah unless i was doing it around this particular material because um um you know it sort of makes sense uh, i mean william moulton marston who was the original writer of wonder woman was a 
Um, you know, one of the most interesting people who ever worked in comics back in those days. He was um, <clears throat> in big contrast to most of the people who worked in the industry at the time, in that he was very highly educated. He had a JDME and a MA and also a PhD in psychology. He was one of the, he considered himself to be one of the inventors of the lie detector. That was actually a little bit of a lie, but um, it was <laughs> so close. It didn't, it didn't work then. Yeah. No, no. Well, of course it doesn't work. I mean, you know, I think America is one of the few nations that still has polygraph tests, right. which is like, get over it, guys. It doesn't work, um, right. um, which is why they're not admissible. But, you know, people still throw it around as a threat. Would you take a polygraph on that? Like, don't be silly. It's a silly device. Um, but um, his PhD thesis was on blood pressure changes and their relationship to sort of human emotion. Um, and that was material that was used in the creation of the lie detector. Um, so he would go around marketing himself as uh, William Alton Marston, inventor of the lie detector. And um, that, of course, I think, I mean, it ties in, if you'll pardon the pun, quite literally with something <laughs> like Wonder Woman's Lasso of Truth, right? right. I mean, the idea that you could sort of wrap something around people and then they will speak the truth to you that is literally right. what the polygraph is um but he i think he was genuinely interested in creating a um superhero who was by the standards of the 1930s and 40s feminist and at the same time his ideas about what constituted genuine feminist politics were um unusual and um by any in any period um and a big part of his interest was in the idea that he genuinely believed that um men w were naturally inclined to enjoy submission in sex but for cultural reasons were fighting against it right were, they felt the need to assert dominance but really they would take more pleasure in submission and so he felt that you could literally make the world a better place reduce violence and aggression if you had more women dominating men sexually right um and i mean it's not the strangest theory for that i've ever heard for you know a sort of a better society but it is it's up there um and it involves this it's very paradoxical in other words it involves good women who will dominate kindly um, so that men can learn to take pleasure in submission. And he'd been thinking about that as a psychological and theoretical concept for about 12, 15 years uh, before he ever created the Wonder Woman character. And she represents uh, a form of wish fulfillment for him, a kind of, you know, dream set of dream scenarios in which he runs his little theories. Right. Um, and if you read his theoretical work, and there's a bunch of it, but before I, a lot of people hadn't. A handful of scholars had looked at it. I wasn't the first person, but most people who think they know Wonder Woman and have written about Wonder Woman or read the Wonder Woman comics had never read Marston's, you know, The Emotions of Normal People, a 400 page long prose psychology text that he wrote. So I, that's what, that's the kind of thing that I, I do. I'm a researcher. So I read that that book and then when i read his comics afterwards i realized all, oh my god his, theor sense. his theories are here you can literally see them on the page he's working out these the and so it isn't um just a kind of um rosie the riveter era feminist uh, uh imagery that we're seeing it's also some some quite idiosyncratic ideas about dominance and submission and that's where the bondage imagery comes in right and so that's definitely the one that has gotten you the most attention and the most you know i mean there's a lot of reasons you've because of you know your passion and you're a scholar of all this stuff so that's but that's definitely one that you speak yeah i mean people on. you know because it's i mean what i can do is i could show people scenes from actual wonder woman comics and right. then explain why how these sort of tie in with the theories that he had about psychology and and it there's almost a one-to-one -one connection sometimes wow. and it, it it really and yeah of course audiences who like wonder woman are fascinated by that sure i also find common comic-con audiences uh, are smart they don't want to only hear about um you know the latest product from dark horse or something like right. that they don't just want panels that are about promotion um they they like it when to, they like to hear creators talk about the process um and they like learning about the history of 
of the medium. You know, not all of them. I mean, 80,000 people go to these conventions and they don't all come to my talks. You know, right. maybe maybe a hundred of them will come to one of my talks. But that's they're there because they want to be. And, right. and that's, a, that's a great audience. So in uh, comics, a lot of times it's fantasy, but it can intertwine with politics. And so we had talked off air about mentioning kind of a controversial uh, thing by Art Spiedelman. So he was the yeah. he was the creator of Mouse. You wanted yeah. to speak on that a little bit more? Sure, sure. So um I mean, you so so this is an intro this happened very recently within the last week or so. Um Spiegelman had been asked by the Folio Society, which is a kind of a high-end um manufacturer of collectible books, right? They make limited edition um sort of coffee table print run books. And they clearly have signed a deal with Marvel to do a reprint of the very earliest Marvel material, superhero material from the thir- 1939 to 1949, which includes things like World War II era Captain America. And they wanted a big name intro, obviously. So they asked Art Spiegelman to write the introduction. Um, and Spiegelman made a, um, a pretty low key reference to Trump at the in his final paragraph. He's talking about the Red Skull, the fascist um, enemy of Captain America in World War Two, and um, he talks about how now an orange skull is haunting America. I might be getting that a little wrong, but it's, sure. you know, basically there was a reference to an orange skull. I'm paraphrasing, but I know that was there, and. Um, uh, somebody at Marvel, I suspect, um, probably um, somebody who, uh, you know, fairly, probably not very high on the on the totem pole, sure. um, but I have no way of knowing. I'm speculating, but obviously somebody at Marvel um, saw that and um, said, that's too political, please remove it. <laughs> Clearly forgetting that they were talking to Art Spiegelman or perhaps not realizing who Art Spiegelman sure. was. Um, and Spiegelman, instead of making the change, pulled the essay from the book and gave it to The Guardian, um, who published it on in the paper and on the website. Now, this book, I should point out, this Folio Society book, is retailing for $225. I mean, I'm the target market, and that's too much for me. I'm not going to spend $225 and that, on Yeah, it. wow. Um, and that's and, a new book. Yeah, it's a new book because it's like a facsimile recreation of Marvel Comics number one. And, you know, like it's a, it's a fancy high-end, um, you know, library edition. Wow. And um, But that means I'd be astonished if the, if the print run was more than 10,000 copies. It's probably less, right? $225 a pop. I would just, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are lots of people who, who have... Uh, you know, maybe it's what the one percent will be reading next year. Sure. But, but but you know, I'd be very surprised if that was a very high print run. Certainly, whatever the print run was, it was probably not even a tenth of the number of people who ended up reading that piece when it ended up in the garden. Right, because it gets so much more exposure because of the controversy. Yeah. yeah. So the the so I guess the moral of the story is, um, I mean, I understand why Marvel um, brand assurance does not want a lot of um, explicit reusing of their characters um, for political purposes. Sure. Um, and I, I mean, you know, I'm not actually going to, I, I wouldn't be a jerk about that. They, that's the economy in which they operate. They're, they're not, they're a business and there are, they don't want to alienate large percent, potentially large numbers of, of, of their audience. Having said that, Marvel has, a very noble tradition of um, standing up against racism, let's say. Right. right? Um, going back to um, Stanley and Jack Kirby's work um, on the Fantastic Four, where they introduced the first black superhero to the Marvel Universe, the Black Panther, in the pages of the Fantastic Four in 1966. Right. Um, and... Um, you know that that's uh, there. There are numerous instances I could point to. In fact, one of the first Marvel comics I ever read, uh, a British reprint of a Spider-Man comic, is about get this right. It's a Spider-Man comic, which is about a race baiting politician named Sam Bullet with two T's, who's running f- to be um, Attorney General uh, in of of uh, New York State. 
Um, and he's running on a quote unquote law and order platform, which everybody in the in the comic recognizes as racist dog whistling. Right. And at the time, J. Jonah Jameson's um, uh, editor, his uh, his editor in chief, he's the publisher, the editor in chief of the da- Daily Bugle, is a character named um, Robbie Robertson, who is very visually even obviously based on Sidney Poitier at this point. Right. That's how they draw. It was Marvel's self conscious attempt to introduce a um, significant middle-class successful african-american supporting character to the cast of spider-man right and he is targeted by this you know right-wing racist um uh politician um who and actually they he uses the word sambo in at one point even he actually uses that word to describe robbie Right. right, And it's the thing that turns J. Jonah Jameson off him. Jameson up to that point has supported him because Bullet's like, I'm going to get Spider-Man too. And we know Jameson hates Spider-Man, right? So he's backing this law and order politician. Um, and then when, it, when he reveals him, when the guy reveals himself to be racist, J. Jonah Jameson says, I'm not supporting you anymore. The Daily Bugle is no longer going to endorse you. And I thought, you know, I just read that at the time, not even thinking about how brave that was to sure, be doing that kind that of material time, in, right. that, in that time, right? But I looked at it recently and thought, you know, J. Jonah Jameson is notoriously one of the biggest jerks in the Marvel Universe, right? Everybody knows this guy is an asshole. And even J. Jonah Jameson knows you don't endorse the fascists. If you right. are a racist, you tell them, get lost. That's what you say. Right. Right. Um, and the, the, these are so there. There's a version of, of of America which you can see in Marvel comics from that period. Um, that is America's best version of itself. Right. You know. Uh, well, uh, it's funny. I mean, it's like you say, Marvel doesn't want to rock the boat. You know, they're like, well, we've got. It's like Michael Jordan said. He's like, I don't talk about politics because Republicans buy shoes too. Right. You know, and so. The, the thing is, is that we're talking about a different thing at this point. We're right. talking about fascism. I mean, the simple fact that an anti-fascist is a political thing, right. like that's insanity. That's yeah, I know. Insanity. I know. We're worried about the feelings of Nazis. I right. mean, like, like, no, we don't have to worry about the feelings of Nazis. Captain America knew that, right? The, right. the cover of Captain America Comics number 1 from 1941, which came out before Pearl Harbor, is what, it's one of the greatest covers in, the, in, in comic book history, and it's Cap punching Hitler in the face right. because that's what you are supposed to do to Nazis. Right. You know, uh, I mean, all, I, I guess I'm also willing to, to, to a limited degree, respect their first amendment rights to talk their poison, but that I'm, is true. Um, but I am also quite happy when they get punched in the face. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, because, you know, because they are the bad guys. Right. They are actually the bad guys. It's tough for people to define what is in the moment what is truly fascism and i mean it's not hard for me to see it but this but. isn't but but you know if if you think that people are inferior to you on the basis of a, a phenotypical um uh, description you know their skin is darker than yours or a different shade of yours or their eyes are a different shape from yours or their hair is a different color from yours or you know if you think that that automatically makes you superior to somebody you are the bad guy sure that is who you are there isn't there's no well and then you know not you know. to get too political but when trump this week orders american businesses to stop doing business with china i mean that's fascism you know, like yeah, that's, well, it, that's the communism and socialism that people always are afraid of. Well, you know, and it's one of the strangest things about his entire mode of, oper- of operating, right? Is that he genuinely seems to think he thinks he's the dictator. That, yeah, okay, he thinks he thought he was running for king. He's, yeah. you know, his sense of how politics operates and his sense of how the political system in this country operates is so ill informed and naive. That's one of the reasons he gets frustrated. He's like, why can't I do that? I'm the president. As if he, as if the president can do anything, right? Now that isn't actually how it works in a democratic republic, right? I mean, that's just like if you knew anything about the history of the nation at all, you would know that you weren't running for king, right? Um, and I actually saw it. I mean, I tr- I saw a tweet from him not so long ago where he was complaining about how no one said this during Obama's reign. He actually used the word reign, right? Because that's how he thinks. 
he thinks that the president is like a kind of king. Right. right? Um, you're they dealing... rule over people. Yeah. 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 You, you, not... you know, it's like, no, 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 no. You work for us. Yeah. Right? That's the forgotten thing. I, I became a citizen um, just a couple of summers ago, actually. And um, I will be voting in my first presidential election next time around. Right. Um, I will be exercising my glorious and hard-earned democratic right sure. to do so. And, um, you know, I mean, I should say this, actually, because it's, it's also, it's possible, you know, this is a public forum that we're in. You're, you're, uh, you're asking me now these questions, I guess, as a, and I'm speaking as a citizen. Um, as a teacher, I would, um, I hope, I have a much more difficult project when it comes to the discussion of politics, right? Um, what, what, I, uh, what I hope that I would am mostly able to do is put these kinds of materials and questions that I am invested in. If you're interested in the history of Marvel Comics, one of the interesting things about the history of Marvel Comics is its treatment of race, which isn't always perfect, but over the longer run, I think they have a right to be proud of it, right? And Putting that in front of students and allowing them to draw their own conclusions is actually part of the art of working in the classroom. Um, I can talk much more candidly with you here, I, I think. Sure. Um, as a sort of a non-U of O sponsored thing. Right. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that in itself, you know, even as I'm speaking about it, it's not like just Marvel that has this problem. It's not just Michael oh, no. Jordan oh, that no. has this problem. Yeah. And even Jordan has um, stepped up, you know, and that was, that comment was made 30 years ago sure and then now i mean he's he's had to take a side because lebron and, and trump are going after each other and right jordan surprisingly has been quiet on all those things and even he had to say like uh, i'm siding with lebron on this one but yeah yeah because he you know he tweeted i like mike right. i mean and and anytime trump refers to somebody of color he calls them what does he say he says they're stupid and anytime he talks about a woman he says they're nasty I mean, it's the same trends. He's terrible. We could be here forever. I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, where you know, certainly where I'm, I'm completely comfortable agreeing with you is that it seems to me that he has given more than ample evidence that he um, takes seriously, actually believes things that are um, uh, uh, ludicrous and appalling. Um, about race, right? That he's he just believes, he also believes things that are ludicrous and appalling about climate change, things that are ludicrous and appalling actually about economics. I mean, his notion of how tariffs work, for oh example, the media seems to have forgotten that there was never a reason to impose these tariffs in the first place. Right? Um, uh, he, it's a, at least the reason that the White House gave does just doesn't conform to how you know. It's not how trade deficits work. Right. Um, he operates um, in it with a 19th century understanding of global economics. Um, and I think probably a 19th century understanding of, of uh, human biology and race, but that's a speculation. Sure. Um, but you see plenty of evidence in the daily pronouncements that this is a person who has ideas um, that are, I think, out of step um with um with with in with a, with a, with contemporary information with just what it's not about left or right it's well, about what we it's it, i'm talking facts based stuff here sure and it's because you know he doesn't have an intrigue or a wonder i guarantee he doesn't read comics Huh, well, you know, you know, you know, and of course, yeah, maybe, I mean, this is, this is, for some people, this would undermine everything that, uh, that I'm saying, but I learned an enormous amount from comics, right? I, oh, learned, sure. I, I learned a lot of what I know um, from comics, and that is because they're a means of communication. They're not, right. they're, they're not uh, a children's medium. There are plenty of material I would never dream of showing my daughter. Sure. Um, just as there's plenty of movies and plenty of novels and plenty of poems that are aimed well above the head of the average child. That's not a knock on good children's literature either. Great children's literature is a great thing. But comics aren't, because they're comics, children's literature. What they are is a form of literature that can work for kids, but it can work for adults too. They can right. tell any kind of story. Well, and there's such a huge range that there's stuff that's for every age group you know, and whatnot. I mean, some of it is not, there's not a target audience because the creator is just making it necessarily, at least if they're doing it from their heart and not just to sell the paperback. Well, you know, and this is a, you know, uh, this is the great challenge for anyone who makes art in a commercial capitalist culture. And, right. and I'm not, 
I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not even fundamentally anti-capitalist. No. You know, I mean, I, th- I, I, I like owning things. You know, sure. I like, um, I like owning my books. Um, I love the existence of libraries, and I believe in being taxed to sustain the existence of libraries. But I also like owning my copies of my books, especially ones that have been signed by, you know, authors sure. who I love, right? And that's the beauty. Those, those are very meaningful things for me. In your career path, you get to bump elbows with a lot of people that you've been it's, inspired by. One of the most wonderful things about my job is not only that I get to meet people who I admire, but I get to introduce them to my students. That's pretty cool. And, um, and my students get to... Um, uh, ask questions directly to people who are working uh, in an industry that they, they are fascinated by. Um, they get to ask uh, real creative people about their artistic process. Um, they get to, and they also can get their books signed at the end of the, the class. And um, I, I just think, um, I think those are, those, those are really wonderful experiences right. to be able to, to cultivate. It, it's, it's and of course you know the, the, the there's an additional fringe benefit in that some of these folks over you know they some of them come back a lot and the, and and they become um my friends and that that's i'm still enough of a fan um to to be excited by sure. the prospect by to be able to say that you know my friend greg rucker wrote this thing that's about to become a tv show right you know right. Uh, um he wrote this uh, this is true it's dropping in the fall this rose city comic con which i'm going to be at in a couple of weeks um uh, i'll be doing a panel with greg rucker who wrote uh, a detective series called stump town which is set in portland uh, about a female private eye um and it's um it's it's a terrific comic. It's been a, I, I've I've liked the comic for like t- ten years now, um, and it's going to be a, a network television show, which is the the uh, the first episode drops in in the fall. Wow! Um, and I feel tremendous pride. It's in like ridiculously. I had nothing to do with it. Sure. In Greg's achievement, but that's partly because Greg Greg was one of the first people. I think he was the first comic book creator I ever asked to come to one of my classes. Actually. Um, and not, and he came and he had a good time and he comes almost every year, um, to talk to, to my students. Uh, you know, and that's, I, I feel like I've, uh, how could I not be yeah. delighted by, by his success when he's been so generous, not just to me, but to the people I teach. Sure. Well, Ben, we're at the out hour point. So amazing. Oh, wow. I know it, it goes by. Quick. Yeah. I appreciate you coming and doing this. Uh, I want to make sure real quick to give a shout out to my sponsor, uh, Oregon Cashflow Pro. Remember, you can get free money management advice at OregonCashflowPro.com. And then we got something special to end this. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, you had your nephew, Marshall. Yes. From the UK. And he had came in, you brought him to the barber shop, and he had told me that he had a band back home. And so at the end of every episode, I play a local song by a local band. So this time I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to play your nephew's band. They're called From August. Mm-hmm. And so this is their song. Uh, thanks again for doing this. You oh, know, you I, so I appreciate it. For this. There you go. <laughs> appreciate right. it, Ben. Yeah, yeah, you're very well. So Ben Saunders, professor at the University of Oregon. Uh, you know, there's so much information about you online. And, and to read his book, it's called Do, Do the Gods Wear Capes? And you've written multiple books, but that's probably the one you've gotten the most acclaim for. That's the superhero book, yeah. So check that out. And then, uh, yeah, so this is your nephew Marshall's band from August. This is Martha's song. Thanks a lot. Wait a minute, waiting for the right one. I heard that you would find a better one. I hope that I don't fade away. Wait a minute, waiting for the right one. Heard you would find a better one. Hope you don't find a better one. Thank you.